we've got that ready, inshallah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Is the sound good and clear for everyone? Okay, alhamdulillah. So I was just talking with Bushra, mashallah, and we were saying that time moves so quickly. And it seems that we always seem to connect right before Ramadan to, to help organize this. And I'm so grateful to the Ikna Sisters Wing, to all of the people who are involved putting this on, to everyone who helped organize and set up, and to all of you for coming so that we may, inshallah, remind one another and have a fruitful discussion about Ramadan. And I was just talking with a few of our sisters, mashallah, about how there are so many different ways to approach the topic of how to prepare for Ramadan. And in preparation for today, I went back and actually looked at the last, I think it may be two or three years that we've had this um, opportunity to, to talk about this topic. And I thought, well, for those who have come the last several years, I don't want to just say the same thing. And so how can we look at this slightly differently? And I feel that, mashallah, the sisters of the Ikhna Sisters Wing, they choose a theme every year. And so I thought that might be a really good way to look at this topic this year. And the theme for this year is Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to witness the month of Ramadan. And so I wanted to pose a few questions to everyone. Why do you think that that dua is part of our prophetic tradition? Why do we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us witness the month of Ramadan? So I'll take shout outs from the audience if you'd like to say what you think about that why do we ask that question of Allah why do we make that dua yes so we can absolutely absolutely so mashallah so the response, if you didn't hear it, was that because this is an opportunity where our deeds are multiplied. And one of the talks that I'm going to share with you all later as a resource, the example that is given is if it were outside and it were raining money, you know, and, and you were told, it's raining money, <laughs> would you just sit inside or would you go outside and try to collect as much as you could? And we often have to put things in a very materialistic sort of example because a lot of us understand, you know, Money helps us do things, and, and money helps us you know, do khair even, but that's what Ramadan is in the spiritual sense, subhanAllah. Our deeds are multiplied, and, and yes, that's a wonderful answer. Yes? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always choose uh, something special, like you choose from day to choose Friday, mm -hmm. like Laylat al-Qadr, you always have chosen days, like uh, 10 days in the Hajj, and 10 days in Ramadan, and you choose some months from the all 12 months in choose Ramadan mm -hmm. to recite the Quran to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this month and make them special, so it's almost special for us. So it's like, you have to repeat, repeat the recite of the Quran and like the sister said before, all oh, this just got like, just not 10, it will be 70 and they got more. So it's like, this is like, our chance to, to charge our soul right. for the list of the, uh, the months. Yes, yeah. no, mashallah, that's a beautiful answer as well. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of time. And as the creator of time, He subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to dictate that there are some times that are half, there is more barakah in them, there is more blessing in them. They are of more importance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than others. And by virtue of knowing that our creator, that the creator of the universe has set aside this month, has chosen this month, that should motivate us to see this month as something special and to want to witness it. So those are two really beautiful answers, mashallah. And I, I, I would encourage all of us to think about that. Why is it that I want to live until Ramadan? What is it that I hope to accomplish? And as a caveat, I will not be able to, to give us everything about Ramadan in 50 minutes but I'm gonna do my best to hit the high points and to encourage us to, to leave this gathering and to learn more. Really, that is my hope, inshallah. Allahumma barik lana fi Sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. May Allah put blessing in these days of Sha'ban for us and allow us to witness Ramadan. May we leave here wanting to take advantage of these days to prepare. That's really the goal. 
So I want to talk about my answer to this question by taking us back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the history of humanity, the history of Bani Adam. And if we want to learn about that history, one of the places we can go is the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَ That I am going to create a vicegerent on the earth. And there's a conversation that ensues between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels. And we know what happens in, in that part of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Prophet Adam alayhi salam, do not eat from this tree. And shaitan does waswasa, right? Shaitan whispers to Adam and his wife. And they do eat from the tree. And they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then Allah tells them something very significant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, فَهْبِتُوا مِنْهَا فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَيَا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, you're going to go down from Jannah. Now realize that from the very beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنِّي جَاعِلُونَ Not fil Jannah. I am not creating for Jannah a Khalifa. I am creating for Al-Ard, for the earth, a Khalifa. So this was part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine plan from the beginning, that, that humanity was going to inhabit the earth. As, as a trial, but also to do good in the earth. And Allah promised that I will send a guidance and whoever follows that guidance, then no fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. So now let's go back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Humanity has lived a long time on the earth. But there is something that happens in the 6th century of Arabia that transforms the history of humanity. You know, if you think about your own life, you've had pivotal moments in your life. If I were to tell you to just pick five of the moments that were most life-changing for you, it doesn't matter if you are seven or if you're 70, you will be able to look back on your life and find five moments that you found pivotal. Maybe it was a relationship that you had with someone. Maybe it was getting married. Maybe it was your first grade teacher. Who, whatever it was, you will be able to find those moments. If we look at the history of humanity, we find this moment. And this moment came on a night when the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was in Ghar Hira, was in the cave of Hira, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the beginning of what would be the most transformational text that was ever revealed to humanity. And that is the Quran. And that happened in what month? In the month of Ramadan. And so because our theme this year is Allahumma balighna Ramadan, Allah allow us to witness the month of Ramadan, I want to talk about Ramadan and talk about it as a transformational month. And I want to talk about how we can tap into the transformative potential of this month. Why does this month help us transform? How did it transform humanity? And how can we inherit that legacy and use it to transform ourselves? And not only to transform ourselves, but to transform our families and our communities and our society and our world. Because I believe, subhanAllah, it has that potential and it has that legacy. So if we look at the Prophet Muhammad if we were to try to talk about some of the challenges that were faced by Prophet Muhammad and by the Muslims of Medina and specifically of Mecca during the Meccan period, what were some of their challenges? If we were to put them into headlines for the New York Times or for you know, the, the Union Tribune in San Diego, what would they look like? Muslims subject to insults in public square. Mosque relocated outside city for safety. Mosque community leaders denounce Islam. Hate crimes intensify against Muslim community. Propaganda war targets Muslims. Government officials spread hatred of Islam. Anti-Islam message goes viral. Now, of course, at the time of the Sahaba, they didn't call it viral. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. Muslim community banned. Muslim couple murdered in their home. SubhanAllah, when I made this slide, 
it didn't hit as hard. I, this slide is, I used in a previous presentation, but after, subhanAllah, recent events with um, our, you know, our three winners, subhanAllah, it really hits home. Coalition of forces attack Muslim city. Muslims sign unfair peace treaty. I mean, the list goes on. These are all headlines that I pulled from the seerah. I looked at the seerah, I looked at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and I thought, how could I translate this into a modern headline? Does this look familiar? <laughs> it's like we're reading it today. This is, these are the challenges that the early Muslim community faced. And they are very, very similar to the challenges that we face today. And we have to ask ourselves, how did they cope? How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them, help them, not only to endure and persevere, but to overcome? You know, to resist. How? And that's really where I, I just point to Ramadan and what was revealed of guidance in Ramadan. That in the Qur'an, there is transformative power for us as individuals and as an ummah. And it has, it has worked in the past. That is how the early Muslims overcame and resisted and, and flourished in the face of such challenges. I actually was, was just at a conference on Islamophobia at UC Berkeley. And I was just astonished by the history of Islamophobia in our world and how so many different communities, whether they be in Spain or in France or in the Arabian Peninsula or in Southeast Asia, in China, so many communities are facing challenges, not just in the United States. And so really it comes back to this month as an opportunity for us. So how do we tap into that transformative potential? That's a really good question. <laughs> How many Ramadans have we lived? Many of us have lived a lot. And inshallah, we have made incremental improvements in ourselves and in our lives. I'm gonna just, I feel like this keeps slipping away and I, I want to make sure that... Okay. Inshallah, we've made incremental improvements in ourselves and in our lives. But how can we continue to do that and how can we do that even more this year? I already drew attention to the fact that the Qur'an was revealed in this month. But there's something else that's really special about this month. There's something we do in this month that, or a lot of things that we do in this month that we don't do at other times. And one of those things is fasting. We give up the cheeseburgers during the day. We give up, you know, the coffee in the morning. <laughs> that's, my, that's one of my struggles. We give up a lot of things during the day in our fast, eating and drinking and intimate relationships with our spouse if we're married. We give those things up, and those are some of the most basic needs and, and, and urges, actually, that a human being has. So how does that help us? How can that help us tap into the transformative power of Ramadan? How does that help us to benefit from the Qur'an? So I call it the mysterious equation of fasting. And mashallah Aisha, jazakallah khairan, she recited the verses from Surah Al-Baqarah that talk about fasting. Now actually, I want to pause for a second because this is a really interesting thought experiment. Let's pretend that you don't know anything about Islam. You've never heard of it. And someone starts telling you about Islam and where do they begin? We always begin with five of something, the five pillars, right? We always start with the five pillars. Well, Islam is based on five and here they are. And so this person is like really into math. Maybe they're quantitatively oriented and they work with graphs and charts and things. And you're telling them the five pillars and they're like, oh, so Ramadan is one fifth of Islam. So where is your holy book? I'm expecting that 20% of your holy book would talk about Ramadan. And you're like, oh yeah, no, uh, no, no. Actually, no, Ramadan is only mentioned in one verse. And they're like, what? How is that possible? 20% of your deen is Ramadan fasting in Ramadan, how is it only mentioned in one verse? So to understand that, and to understand this, we need to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that one verse, and in the few verses surrounding that one verse. And Aisha read them to us already, but I'm going to do a little bit of a recap of what they're saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I think I have these on a slide. No, let me go back. We will get to these. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us essentially that fasting was prescribed upon us as it was prescribed upon those before us. And he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, la'allakum tattakun. La'allakum is not like a definitive, right? It's not like you, because then you will attain taqwa. La'allakum is so that you may attain taqwa. So here, there's that transformative potential. Fasting is prescribed upon us so that we may attain taqwa. There is transformative potential in fasting, and we need to understand it better. But interestingly, that verse about fasting was revealed before the verse about Ramadan. It was not revealed at the same time. There was some years in between them. And I'm not sure of the exact number of years, but I know that it was revealed well in advance of when the fasting of Ramadan was prescribed. So the early Muslim community was fasting similar to the Jewish community in Arabia, as other people of the book had fasted. They were fasting the three middle days of the month. They were fasting similar days. And it was known that fasting helped increase taqwa. So how is that? So what is taqwa, first of all? Well, taqwa is something that is proportional to the spiritual health of our hearts. Taqwa, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is taqwa? And he pointed to his heart, والسلام, and he said three times, at taqwa ha huna. Taqwa is here. Taqwa is in the hearts. So it's related to the spiritual health of our hearts. Taqwa comes from the word waqaya, which means to to want to protect yourself from harm, but also to want to do good things to keep yourself out of harm. It's not, it's not connoted with fear completely. It's not like you're just doing it because you're afraid. You could take positive steps in order to have taqwa. And I think that's an important distinction. Like when, when people go for hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَتَزَاوَدُوا وَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى and take, prep, make preparations. Prepare yourself. Take the water that you're gonna need, take the food that you're gonna need, and the best of those preparations is taqwa. So it's, it's talked about in that context. So we need to realize that fasting was prescribed upon us. Even in Arabic, like if you were to go to a doctor, and you come out from the doctor, someone might ask you, katab lik e? What did the doctor prescribe for you? Kutiba alaykum usiyam. It was ordained for you, it was prescribed for you. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us we need a prescription so that we can have taqwa in our hearts means that we might have a little bit of a sickness in our hearts, right? And I think that's a really good assumption. It's a very safe assumption because when we are complacent and when we are arrogant and we say, oh no, I don't have any problems. You know, there are patients actually that go into the doctor's office and they're being dragged by a family member. And the family member is saying, doctor, this patient, every time they go up the stairs, they're out of breath, they're complaining of chest pain. And the patient's like, I don't have a problem. I am fine, leave me alone. I'm not sick. I don't need medicine. I don't need an echo, right? I don't need an EKG. I don't need a stress test, I'm fine. A lot of times in our spiritual health, we're the same way. We hear the khutbah and we're like, oh yeah, that, that applies to my friend. That applies to my sister. That applies to my brother. But we never think about the, the, the spiritual diseases of our own hearts and how we may need to remedy those. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just telling us, look, I'm giving you this prescription. Because most likely, more likely than not, the ummah needs it. And so what happens when we have a sick heart? Well, there's our sick heart. Our sick heart is more prone to doubts and desires. And those doubts and desires, when they grow, they actually feed our nafs. And I've talked about this in previous Ramadan talks, and so I'm not going to get into too much of it. But the nafs is that part of us that is prone to disobeying Allah. And the nafs is very dangerous. It's maybe more dangerous than shaitan because it's always with us and always telling us, you know, it's actually kind of the vehicle by which shaitan gets to our hearts, is through our nafs. And this becomes this cyclical sort of cycle where everything feeds back on everything else. 
So the sick heart can make the nafs, allow the nafs to be stronger. It doesn't, it doesn't have as, as good of a defense against a strong nafs. And I feel, subhanAllah, if you look at the state of, just the state of our ummah in general, but even if you start to look at some of the particular phenomena that we are seeing, you realize that people are taking their desires as their gods. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about those people in the Qur'an. Have you seen the one who takes their desires as their God? And I feel like, subhanAllah, those desires are being beautified and glamorized and they're being called Islamic. <laughs> they're being called Muslim. Look, this is, this is great. We can be Muslim and, and follow our desires and it's all good. But I would argue that no, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined for us what it means to follow Islam and gave us the choice. It's not by coercion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very persuasive, but not coercive. And so here it is, this is Islam. It's a beautiful gift if you'd like to take it. But we can't then deform the gift and say, no, no, this is Islam, I prepackaged it, it looks much more beautiful now. Let's use it this way. So there's definitely symptoms of this in our world. So I'm arguing today that fasting helps us to strengthen the spiritual health of our hearts. And I'm going to talk very quickly about how it does that, and then we'll move on to some of the other ways that we can tap into the transformative potential of Ramadan. But essentially, one of the speakers that I was listening to put it really simply, that when you fast, your body is at war with your heart. Your spiritual heart, where the taqwa is supposed to live, it's saying, no food, no water, no coffee, until Maghrib. And your body is saying, I want my burrito. I want my donut, right? I need my coffee. I need my coffee, right? The body is saying this. And at every moment that your body is telling you that it wants these things, your spiritual heart is saying no, right? It's saying no, no. And the more we use any muscle, the stronger it gets. So in Ramadan, we have a whole month of training for the spiritual muscle of our hearts. And as we use that spiritual muscle, it's like doing bicep curls, by the end of the month, that spiritual muscle comes out much, much, much stronger. And I don't think any one of us would argue that just by virtue of fasting alone, you gain some kind of spiritual strength and discipline. It can, it can wear, <laughs> it can wear off. But I feel like in those first few days after Ramadan, you, it's tangible, like in, in Eid prayer. We come out stronger, subhanAllah. And there's something really important about that. So here's our heart. Our heart is healthy. There's something really important about having a heart that is spiritually strong. In past talks, we've looked just at this angle, just at the importance of a sound heart. And we've compared the heart to our eyes. And we've done that not because I think it's a cool metaphor, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares the hearts to the eyes. And Allah tells us in the Qur'an, it is not the eyes that go blind, but the hearts that are within the chest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how people are blinded وَعَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ um, I, I can't remember the exact ayah right now, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often talks about how the hearts become blinded. And so if we think about the eye and try to make that metaphor a little bit stronger to understand why we need our hearts to be healthy, why we should be excited about making our hearts healthy through fasting. And a lot of, I think a lot of you have heard this metaphor from me before, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly. Our eyes help us see. They're very, very complex organs. They have rods and cones and all kinds of different parts to them. And if any part of them does not function well, we will not see well. Diseases of the eye are, are so many and so varied. So they're very important. There is the, the heart, similar to the eyes, is a source of spiritual perception. It helps us see. When you're in a spiritual dilemma, you don't look at it with your eyes and say, what's gonna be the best course of action for me? You, you understand it with your heart. 
So if we want to be able to use our heart spiritually in the best way, we need them to be free of diseases. We also need them to be unobstructed. And we need a source of light. And this is just like our eyes. I could have really, really good eyesight, but if someone puts a blindfold over my eyes, I'm not going to see. If maybe the, my, heart, my eyes are not functioning very well and I forget my glasses one day, I'm not going to see. And similarly, if I've got my glasses on and there's no blindfold on, but it's pitch black in here, I'm not going to be able to see. So fasting helps us with the first, it helps us with the first two. Fasting helps us improve the spiritual health of our hearts. And I, I just explained that, right? It's like a spiritual muscle. It's getting healthier and healthier as we are disciplining the nafs and feeding the spiritual energy of the heart, not only by the fast, but through all the things we do in Ramadan, the reading of Qur'an and the increase in our dhikr and the increase in salah and the increase in charity. And we're going to talk about some of those points. But essentially, Ramadan is a training ground for our spiritual heart. And it's also an expiation of sins. And sins are like a blindfold on the heart. It's in the Quran, it's referred to as a ran. Like whatever they were doing of evil has caused a blindfold to be on their hearts. But the third one, our hearts are not going to just illuminate the path for us. Just like our eyes don't have an internal flashlight that, that beams out, maybe one day. <laughs> but right now, we, we need an external source of light to help guide us. And that is the Qur'an, subhanAllah. And so it's very interesting how the, the, the ayat of the Qur'an are ordered. Allah tells us fasting was prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those before you, so that you may achieve taqwa. You know, a number of days. And Allah gives a few qualifications to that. Whoever is sick or traveling, then they can do this or do that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the very next verse tells us, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan, it's not the month of fasting. That's not the first thing that Allah says about it. Allah says it is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. So it's like we have been primed to know, you know what, this Qur'an that was revealed in Ramadan, if I'm going to benefit from it, my heart has to be spiritual health, spiritually healthy. That taqwa, that has to be strengthened in my heart. My heart has to be free of those diseases and, and I have to remove the blindfolds and then I will be able to benefit from Al-Qur'an alladhi unzila fihi, I mean, shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudan lil-nas the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as a guidance to mankind and as a clear proof of guidance. So the Qur'an actually is our light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in another surah talking about the Qur'an that we should believe in Allah and the Prophet and the light which was sent with him referring to the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is that light that helps us to spiritually see and perceive. So these are those verses, subhanAllah, and it's really amazing when you think about the fact that Ramadan is only mentioned once in the Qur'an, and that the verse doesn't start by telling us Ramadan is the month of fasting, but it actually starts by telling us Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. And that the previous verse tells us that when you fast, your heart becomes more spiritually healthy so that you can better benefit from the Qur'an in Ramadan. And since Aisha, mashallah, was able to go through these verses at the beginning, I won't read them, but we are familiar with them, but it's worth our effort, inshallah, to ponder on them and reflect and read the tafsir and read different tafsirs and really understand them, subhanAllah. Here we go. So what happens when our hearts go through that spiritual training during the month of Ramadan? We are now better able to overcome, resist, and even thrive in the face of the challenges that I talked about earlier. Not for just the month of Ramadan, but for a whole month later, for a whole year later. So for the next 11 months, we have gained spiritual muscle. Now, like I said, that spiritual muscle can can, can wane. 
it can diminish. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a lot of, there's in our sunnah, we have fasting at other times throughout the year. We have other times of the year in which we are more and more focused on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the days of Dhul Hijjah. MashaAllah, the sister here was reminding us of all of those blessed times during the year. But Ramadan is really that intense course for spiritual health. So how else is Ramadan transformative? And for the sake of time, I think each of these could be an hour lecture in itself. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hit the highlights. Like I said, to motivate us to, to leave this gathering and use the coming days in preparation. Not so that this is the be all end all of our preparation. So how else do we tap in to the transformative potential of Ramadan? What else is it about this month that helps us transform? And subhanAllah, I cannot tell you how many people I have heard talk about a Ramadan where they were so focused in their dua and so focused on their, their inner discipline and their, their, the transformation of themselves. And they'll point to that and they say, that was the Ramadan that changed my life. And some of you may be able to ha- nod your heads and say, yeah, I've had one of those. And some of you, mashallah, may Allah bless you, might say, yes, Ramadan is like that for me every year. It changes my life. So I pray, inshallah, that that this Ramadan will be like that for us and that Allah will allow us to witness this and many more Ramadans to come and that they will continually increase our taqwa and change our lives and reorient us towards Allah, inshallah, for the better. It's just a beautiful time, subhanAllah. So Ramadan facilitates our connection with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, we are told in Ramadan that when we pray a fard, that reward is magnified. And when we pray the sunnah, we get the reward of the fard. So we are definitely, it's kind of like when it's raining money, we are more focused on making sure we make not only those obligatory prayers, but those extra prayers. Then after Aisha, we have an opportunity to stand and communicate with Allah in tarawih for many additional rakahs. So I think that Salah has become very mechanical for a lot of us. And I can attest to that myself. There are times when you are going through the motions of Salah and you just don't feel like you're coming out of it more connected to Allah than when you began. This is a month where we can change that. This is a month where we really, we're not eating, we're not drinking. We have shut down the nafs to some extent and allowed another part of us to come to the surface. It is much easier to focus on your salah in Ramadan. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. This is a gift from Allah. It's much easier to fast in Ramadan. It's much, and we'll talk about why that is. You know, the, the gates of Jannah are open and the gates of Jahannam are shut and the shayateen are locked away. And Allah actually facilitates for us the ability to connect with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word salah actually comes from sila, which means a chain. So salah is supposed to connect us with our creator. If we think about each of our salah as a time to connect with Allah, not just to connect with Allah, but a time to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Fatiha is a dua. We are actually in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are beautiful times in salah to make dua, in sujood. We're told to ask Allah when we're in sujood. So I'm studying communication and really interesting scholarship in communication, and it's old scholarship, nothing new, tells us that the more you talk with someone, the more you disclose of yourself to someone, the more you tell someone, this is just what's really bothering me, the stronger your relationship is with that person. al And to Allah are the highest examples. So if this is what it's like with humans, this group of authors, they showed how there's this sort of when you're with someone, when you're in the vicinity of someone, when you're close to someone, why do people end up marrying their neighbors? Why do people end up best friends with the kids they sat next to in class? It's because the closer you are to someone, the more in communication you are with that person. The, the higher the chances are of you liking and loving and having a strong relationship with that person. You know? There's a saying that distance makes the heart grow fonder, but not if you never communicate. <laughs> We're talking distance, like in the time when people used to write letters to each other and wait for the letter to come. And 
That kind of distance, but not like distance, I'm never going to talk to you and never going to see you. That kind of distance makes relationships die. So in Ramadan, it has been facilitated for us that we connect with Allah. And coming out of Ramadan, we have the opportunity to feel a closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we haven't felt all year. There are moments in Ramadan where that door of closeness to Allah gets opened for us. But if we're rushing around, preparing meals, or just busying ourselves with other things, we won't feel it. So we need to be in tune to that. The more knowledge that we have of something, the easier it is to appreciate that thing, and the easier it is to do actions for that cause. And the more action we do, the more likely we are to be committed to that. So in Islam, the more knowledge we have of our Creator, the closer we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're more likely to appreciate the little things in life, good or bad, that happen to us as signs from Allah. Because we know Allah is the most merciful. We know Allah is not going to send us something that we can't bear. And it just goes around. The more likely we are to turn back to Allah and to increase our salah and increase our dua. And that just makes our commitment to this relationship with Allah grow stronger. So that's facilitated for us in this month. How else does Ramadan help us transform? How else do we tap into the transformative power of this time? And one of those ways is in that Ramadan cultivates gratitude in us and generosity. There is so much suffering in our world right now, not just among Muslims, but among our human brothers and sisters. There is so much suffering. And we are so blessed. We are like drowning in the blessings. During Ramadan, we just get like a small taste of what it feels like to wake up and, and not have eaten or not just open the fridge and eat whatever we want. We get a small taste of what it feels like to be weak physically because we haven't had water all day. These are like token sort of things that Muslims say about Ramadan, right? We hear it all the time, like Ramadan increases our empathy for the poor and it makes us such good people because we feel what it feels like to not have. But you know what? It's very true. It is very true. And even if those are cliche and they're often said, this is part of our tradition. This is why we do this. It's part of the reason we do this. And so we have to realize that I shouldn't just be complaining all day about not having my coffee. If I do that, then maybe I'm not gonna tap into the gratitude that I should be feeling for those days when I do have. Whatever it is that you love. I'm sorry I keep coming back to coffee. I've become a coffee addict since I started graduate school. <laughs> but whatever it is. So that gratitude, and then the, the desire to share the blessings that we have with others. It's facilitated for us in Ramadan. And the Prophet was the most generous. And he, alayhi salatu wasalam, peace be upon him, was the most generous in Ramadan. So it is part of our sunnah to use this month as a catalyst for our giving, to help us increase our generosity. Ramadan also helps us establish better habits. And this is, we're almost at the end. And we will, inshallah, open it up to discussion and some feedback and comments and questions. But Ramadan helps us establish better habits. When the Muslim community was asked to fast a Yemen Madudet, the tafsir of a Yemen Madudet is something less than 10 days. So they were fasting like maybe three days in the middle of the month or the day of Ashura as the Jewish community had fasted. There was, I, I'm not, like I said, I need to go back to the tafsir and understand exactly what was happening at that time and, and when it was that Ramadan was prescribed how, how much time lapsed in between those two verses. But they were not fasting a whole month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a whole month because that is enough time for us to really establish good habits. And it has been psychologically proven that you don't establish a good habit in a day. I've tried and it didn't work. <laughs> you need time. You need time and you need discipline and you need to be persistent. If you want to get into an exercise regimen, if you want to follow a healthier diet or a healthier lifestyle, if you want to be going to sleep at a specific time or waking up at a specific time, you need time. So Allah gives us a month. It's like amazing. It's a prescription. Really, it's a prescription from the, the creator of the universe, subhanAllah. 
So here's the scary part. It was narrated that Abu Huraira said, the messenger of Allah, uh, peace be upon him, said, there has come to you, no, I'm sorry, this isn't the scary part. This is the happy part, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the happy part. There has come to you, Ramadan, a blessed month, which Allah, the Almighty and Sublime, has enjoined you to fast. In it, the gates of heaven are opened and the gates of hell are closed. Now again, this is why it's easier, right? It's easier to be good in Ramadan. And, ev- and every devil is chained up. In it, Allah has a night which is better than a thousand months. Whoever is deprived of, his, of its goodness is indeed deprived. So this hadith is actually in relation to establishing good habits. But it has been made easier for us. It is facilitated for us in the month of Ramadan. Okay, now we're going to get to, I think, the scary hadith. This is the scary hadith. This, this hadith terrifies me. It really does. This hadith says that the Prophet said, Many people who fast get nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst. And many people who pray at night get nothing from it except wakefulness. And I think we've probably heard this hadith. And in looking at our scholarship in Islam, we're told that fasting is not just about these external layers. It's not just about giving up eating and drinking. There are internal dimensions to our fast, and that was the topic of one of our Ramadan talks a couple years ago. How do we benefit at the internal level from our fast so that we're not one of these people? But how can we today, what kind of a reminder can we give each other so that we're not one of these people? How, what do we do? Well, today my encouragement and my argument to all of us is that we prepare. If you've ever been a student, you know that you cannot sleep all semester and wait until like a day before the exam and be prepared. You can't, you can't prepare in a day. Imam Taha was giving a beautiful khutbah about Sha'ban recently and was saying that, I don't remember if it was one of, the, one of our scholars or, or who it was, or a Sahabi who said that in Rajab you plant the seeds and in Sha'ban you water the seeds and in Ramadan you harvest the fruit. So we are in that time right now. You might think, well, I haven't planted any seeds, Sister Maro, what am I going to do? It's okay, plant them now. Plant them now and water them now and pray for Allah, pray from Allah for barakah. And that, that's really it. We have two weeks. We're in the middle of Shaban. And this is an amazing and beautiful month in which the Prophet ﷺ used to fast. Used to fast this month. And some of the Sahaba used to say we would see the Prophet ﷺ fasting and think he was never going to break his fast. And Aisha said that I never saw the Prophet ﷺ fasting a month other than Ramadan, you know, fasting more in a month other than Ramadan than in Shaban. So I would really encourage us, if you have days that you need to make up from the past Ramadan, or even if you do not, find a few days in the next few weeks, these next two weeks, and fast those days. And fast them with the intention of, oh Allah, I am preparing, I am studying, I'm putting in the time at the library, the spiritual library, to get myself ready so that when Ramadan begins, I'm not caught off guard. I don't need a whole week just to be into my fast. That, that happens so often. You know what happens? We cram Ramadan into the last 10 days. That's what happens, really. We don't prepare for Ramadan. I'm, I should say me. I. It's me. Because <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I have done this. I don't prepare for Ramadan. Then Ramadan begins and I'm so tired and so not used to fasting and so miserable, astaghfirullah, that I can't even get into the spiritual inner dimension of the fast at all. I'm just trying to get through the day. And it's not until those last 10 nights when I think, okay, you need to kick yourself into gear and try to take advantage of this month. And then it's over. And then I start to cry on Naid and I just think, oh Allah, I didn't take advantage of the month. Knowledge is power. The more that we know the more that we prevent ourselves from falling into that. Inshallah, this was a younger and stupid self of mine that will never come back. <laughs> but I just, I'm just you know, giving us that example. And I want to put it on me because I know I've been guilty of it in the past. But it is something that ha- we have the potential to fall into. So we don't want to cram. So where do we begin? It was narrated that Abu Huraira said that the Prophet said, my servant, this is a hadith Qudsi. 
This is a hadith qudsi, which means that this is the Prophet ﷺ speaking the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told him to speak. This, this is a hadith qudsi. These are Allah's words spoken through the Prophet. The Quran is Allah's words spoken by Allah. But a hadith qudsi is Allah's word spoken through Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And this says, my servant draws not near to me with anything more loved by me than the religious duties I have enjoyed upon him or her. So there's nothing that we can do in these days right now that is more beloved to Allah than making sure that we are praying our fara'id, than making sure that we are not doing anything haram. Those obligatory things that Allah has told us to do, we need to make sure that we do those first. Don't be doing the extra credit and leaving the major assignment. That's kind of the beginning of this hadith. This is a long hadith. This is just the beginning. So we start there. But then, and my servant continues to draw near to me with the sunnah, the supererogatory works, so that I shall love him. So that means that we continue to draw closer to Allah with those sunnah, those acts of sunnah. So I'm praying all five prayers. I can now add the sunnah prayers. I am, you know, I, I'm not doing anything. I'm not eating haram food, but I'm going to try to maybe fast a few extra days. I'm doing the obligations but I'm going to do something extra. And one of the scholars, subhanAllah, tells us that those extra things, it's kind of like if you build this beautiful mansion and it is filled with valuables. That is the fard. And the extra things, that's the security gate or the garden that you put around that mansion so that it is not easily accessible to thieves and robbers and burglars. Shaitan wants to rob us of our fard. Shaitan wants to distract us in our salah. Shaitan wants to have us fall into doubts and follow our desires and do things that are displeasing to Allah. But when we surround those obligatory things with extra sunnah acts in the way that the Prophet ﷺ did them, then we're putting a barrier between shaitan and those fara'id, those obligations. And that's a really beautiful way to think about it. It's like a warm-up. I'm going to pray four rak'ahs of sunnah before dhuhr just to warm up so that I can really benefit from my dhuhr prayer. And then Allah tells us, when I love him or her, I am the hearing with which that person hears, the seeing with which that person sees. In the Arabic, it's masculine, so it's translated into the masculine. But this is encompassing of all genders. I just want to make sure everyone knows that. His hand with which he strikes and his foot with which he walks. Were he to ask something of me, I would surely give it to him. And were he to ask me for refuge, I would surely grant him it. So it's a beautiful hadith. It's beautiful motivation that in these next two weeks, we really take care of the fara'id. We really feel motivated to do the sunnahs. We really warm up so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us and will enable us now to use our eyes and our ears and our limbs in a way that pleases him. That's what this last part means and will accept our dua. And that brings us to the power of dua. Were he to ask something of me, I would surely grant it to him. This is the last thing, inshallah, that we're gonna talk about. Ramadan encourages us to make dua. And it's amazing because when you look in the Quran, the very next verse after the verse about Ramadan talks about dua. It tells us, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ it's just like, wow, like, kind of like hits me like a ton of bricks because it's so beautifully arranged. It's just, subhanAllah, it, the verse is saying, and if your servant asks you about me, this is talking to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is, to my knowledge, the only place in the Quran where the 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 equation of the verse usually is, if they ask you about me, tell them this. Then tell them this. Yes, aluna ta'an al ahilla kul heya mawakitu lin nasi wal hajj. They ask you about the hilal, the moon. Tell them it is so people can tell time and know the months of hajj. And so it's always that equation. They ask you about this, then tell them this. But in this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي And when my servant asks about me, فَإِنِّي 
Qareeb. I am definitely very close. So Allah is telling us, use this opportunity to make dua, not just in Ramadan, all the time, even now, but especially in Ramadan. There are beautiful, beautiful moments when our dua is accepted and when we can continue that conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the verse. So let them respond to me and believe in me that they may be rightly guided. And of course, that brings us sort of back to where we started, that the Prophet ﷺ was making dua, essentially, going to Ghar Hira and reflecting, meditating, asking to be shown the guidance, asking to be shown the way out of all of the problems and trials that his society was facing. And it was there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him the answer to that dua. And the answer to the, to the dua of his father Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was making, when he was building the Kaaba and praying that Allah send a messenger from among these people. And Laylatul Qadr is one of the nights that we seek in the last 10 nights. And like I said, we don't want to just cram all of Ramadan into the last 10 nights, but we definitely don't want to fall asleep in the last 10 nights. SubhanAllah, that's another beautiful, beautiful opportunity where we tap into the transformative potential of this month. Where when we make a dua, that could be the dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts and really just facilitates for us some kind of a life-changing course. We may be struggling with something, a decision that we're having trouble making, difficulty in a relationship, you know, a family member that we're concerned about. There's transformative potential in Ramadan through our dua. There's transformative potential in Laylatul Qadr through our dua. And we just, we have to remind ourselves of that. Lastly, I want to talk about something that might seem unrelated. All of us have individual skills and talents. All of us have something that we want to show to Allah and say, look, Allah, you gave me this, you gave me this, and here's what I did with it. It's kind of like we all have these different doors through which we can get closer to Allah. Someone, it might be really easy for them to fast, and they love to fast, and they want to fast in the most beautiful way, and they want to show Allah and say, Allah, I did this, this is what I did, it was made easy for me, and I trained myself, and here's what I did. Someone else may be doing their fasting as, as you know, needed and, and as prescribed by Allah, but they're really good at art. And they're able to make something beautiful and inspirational and, and helpful to the ummah or educate people to use art as therapy. Or There's so many examples. Someone else may be good you know, at, at engineering or at physics. And they're able to use that skill with sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I feel like everyone in here knows about some untapped potential in them. You know there's something in you. It's itching to get out. Use Ramadan as an opportunity to make dua that Allah help you bring that potential to the surface. That Allah put barakah in your time and your efforts so that you may really thrive in that area. And for, it may be in your relationships with your family. Allah, I know it's in me to be a better mother, sister, spouse, daughter than I am being right now. Help me do that beautifully. Help me do that for your sake with ikhlas. So we all have different doors. But it's beautiful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there is a different context now. There is a beautiful door for those who are fasting, bab al-rayyan, that those who fast will enter Jannah, it's inside of Jannah actually, as it is described. And so as you're thinking about your own door and your own way of getting closer to Allah and you're fasting during the month of Ramadan, realize that just by virtue of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising us a, a beautiful reward, inshaAllah. Lastly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that fasting is for me and I alone reward it. That we do all of these good deeds, li anfusina. We do them for ourselves, but fasting is for Allah. 
Someone who accepted Islam as an adult once said, of all the acts of worship in Islam, fasting is my favorite. And someone was like, are you crazy, girl? Why is fasting your favorite? Like, what are you talking about? And the, the lady was like, no, fasting is my favorite because nobody knows if I'm fasting. Nobody sees me. I can be fasting and nobody knows except Allah. It's just between me and Allah. And I just thought, I just get goosebumps, right? Just saying that. It is for Allah. And Allah will help us. Allah will help us do it, but we have to come to Him. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ We have to try to come toward Allah, and Allah will come running. So that is the conclusion of the talk. Um, I hope that there was some benefit in it, and I hope that I didn't speak so quickly for so long that it, it got boring. But I really, I just ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us find it within ourselves to really prepare these coming days so that we may make the most of this Ramadan, tap into its transformative potential, use it as a pivotal moment in our lives to reorient ourselves toward Allah and to really find that within us that will please Allah and do more of it in the coming year. So Jazakum Allah Khairan for your attention. Again, Jazakum Allah Khairan to the Ikna Sisters Wing for putting this beautiful event together and for organizing this and treating us to this beautiful feast, mashallah. And to all of you for your attendance. And I think we have time. Is that what we're supposed to do now? Is comments or questions or is that? Okay. So if there are any questions or comments. So, you know, a lot in your presentation was mentioned about the heart. You know, uh, and uh, and you were mentioning That's a great brain, question. Because your brain controls everything, and I feel that when I'm fasting, my mom, I'm controlling my body to my mind, okay. to my brain. Mm -hmm. And I think I and the heart and the mind also con connects to the heart. Mm -hmm. So, and mind is telling the heart to do what, what they're supposed to, what it's supposed to do, right? Right. Right. And the heart circulates the blood, and you know, and there. <coughs> so that's that's been my question, uh, and I've been questioned about that as well. Yeah. And if people ask me how can you do this, how can you how can you fast, I say, well, it's all about controlling your mind over uh, over your body. Right, right. And that's how, and that's where you learn how to self-control yourself from any temptations that come to your mind. Your heart. It's not just about you know staying uh, you know. Uh, hungry all day long. Right. It's about how you prevent your temptations in doing good deeds and you know and not indulging in others and your mind tells you you know right. don't, don't yeah. okay so that was a wonderful question. I don't know if everybody heard it. But the question is we're talking a lot about the heart, but what about the mind? Doesn't what role does the mind play? And isn't maybe the mind in that kind of that place of of primacy or the most important sort of thing that helps us get through our fast and isn't it really about disciplining our mind over our body mind over matter and that's a great question and I will tell you I one of the areas that I, I love to to study is Islamic psychology and I feel that the field of Islamic psychology gives us a different sort of orientation to understand cognitive function should we stop or should we just keep okay we'll inshallah break at the Iqama and we'll go to pray Asr, inshallah, we'll pray right here. But I'll just try to wrap this up, inshallah. Um, cognitive function, subhanAllah, it, we have to include the heart in that understanding when we talk about it from an Islamic framework. Because 